Okay, the city of Mycota today, the last group of our mycelial fungi. So this is a mycelial fungus. Now I've made one change to the PowerPoints from the one you have. I've just taken that picture that was on the second slide and put it on the first slide. Everything else is the same as your version. Just the picture is now on the first slide and on the second, instead of on the second. Those are Shakti mushrooms. Those are very edible, delicious mushrooms. These are growing out at the North Carolina Farmer's Market out in Greensboro. A couple years ago, I photographed them out there. They grow on oak logs. Some of the fun these groups of fungi are wood rot fungi, so they grow in the logs. The mycelia grows in the log, and then the fruiting bodies pop out like that, and of course we eat, pull those off and eat them. And these are specialist decomposers on oaks. They only grow on oaks. So there's the mycelial fungi. There's two big groups of these fungi. There's a group that does not have differentiated sex organs. And this is actually the mushrooms, the shell fungi. coral fungi, there's a whole bunch of them. I'm not gonna list them all here. We'll go through them as we get through the lecture today. So there's a whole bunch of these guys that the major groups of these fungi do not have differentiated sex organs. So they're gonna reproduce by some form of conjugation as we talked about in the parasexual cycle of the ascomycota. And then there's a group with differentiated sex organs. And this group are the parasitic, the Cidiomycota. They're very important, which means very bad, parasites, especially of crops. These are the rusts and the smuts. Even the names sound bad. So they cause or have caused tremendous amounts of damage in the past. We'll talk mainly about these guys next time. I hope we can get to the beginning of their talking about them today because these have the most complex life cycles. We are finally at the stage. We are going to look this week, at the beginning of next week, at the most complex life cycles in the whole course. It's everything after that is going to get easy. And well, not everything. The life cycles will get a lot easier. So we're going to do the most complex life cycles. That means that before you come to lecture next time, if I don't get through them today, and even if I do get through them today, you should spend some time looking at these life cycles from your textbook. Of the, it's the teleomycete, and we'll talk about these names in just a second. So the rust and the smuts. Look over that life cycle. It's going to take a little while to understand what's going on. So you remember in the ascomycota, we have one characteristic that is very typical for all ascomycota. And if, all ascomy if, a, if an organism has this characteristic, it's an ascomycota. If it doesn't, it's not. What was that characteristic? As an ascus. The cidiomycota are the same. There is one characteristic that defines all the cidiomycota, and that is a basidium. Basidium means a small pedestal. And mycota, of course, is the division ending for the fung kingdom fungi. So these are the pedestal fungi. Now, the basidium has a lot of different shapes within the basidial mycota, and we'll look at those in a minute. But there's always a basidium of some kind that, uh, that occurs in these groups. Here we are with our phylogeny, and we're in the fungi now. And within that fungi, we've got the ascomycota and our new group for this week, the basidiomycota. Basidiomycota. So just to remind you where we are in that group. Here's a rough life cycle. I'm just going to rough this out right now. 
to find our different stages of this life cycle, and we'll go through it in more detail later on. So we know we've got, the mush we've got these mushrooms that form the major part of the life cycle. There's the mycelium. which grows either underground or in the leaf litter or in terms of the wood rot fungi grows into the, into the wood itself and decays the wood. And then the mushrooms or the fruiting bodies come out of that and the fruiting bodies are going to be called basidiocarps. And you know the roots, basidium, pedestal, carp fruit. Now your book, of course, uses another term, that awful term which I've made fun of already, except in the Ascomycota, and it calls them, ah, now I've forgotten what they call them. <laughs> it ends in oma, um, basidioma. I'm not even going to write it on the board. It's a morbid growth of the basidia, and I don't like those terms because who wants to eat a morbid growth? <laughs> Where are major parts of the life cycle? Well, if you see, there's something going on over here that looks like conjugation. Looks like that because it is, except this is plasmogamy. So that is where conjugation takes place. Or you remember from the ascomycota and the parasexual cycle, we also said we could call that somatogamy. The fusion of the bodies, soma, body, gammy, marriage. That's not the karyogamy. Karyogamy is going to take place over here. I'm going to have to erase basidia carp so I can draw my division lines. So karyogamy is going to take place on the gills of the mushroom. Those are those flat, planar structures that are underneath the cap of the mushroom. And meiosis is going to take place in the same place. So that means that this whole mycelium, fruiting body, basidio, basidiocarp portion is all dikaryotic. And that is almost all of the life cycle because our diploid portion here is going to be one cell. It's going to be the basidium. The dip, it's going to be a diploid basidium, like there was a diploid ascus, single cell. And after meiosis, we're going to get our haploid spores. And the only haploid cells are going to be those spores and then a small primary mycelium. So the primary mycelium is quite short-lived in these cases. That's the basic outline. Let's go look at the structures in some more detail and we'll come back and look at the life cycle again several other times. So here's our basidium, two views of basidium. Here's a light micrograph, a little higher magnification than we have in our lab, unfortunately, but there's the basidium, the pedestal. And here's the basidia spores. Here are the basidia spores again. Look at how many there are. Not eight, so four, and that suggests that it comes from, where do you know you get four cells from? I hope I was hearing meiosis and not mitosis. So meiosis produces four cells. We're not having here, we don't have eight cells, so there's not a subsequent mitotic cell division after meiosis. But in the basidium, we have meiosis taking place and then these four haploid spores are produced. 
So this is a typical basidium as it would look like in a mushroom, a typical mushroom. Another interesting feature of this group, the basidiomycota, is that again, there are holes within the cell walls. And there's two ways that, that those holes can occur in the two different groups. So we've talked about the two groups already, the non-parasitic and the parasitic ones. This is a electron micrograph through one of the cell walls and the non-parasitic one, the mushrooms. I like this, the mushrooms and their relatives. And this kind of septum here, where there's that little swelling at the end, that is called a dolopore septum. And you see there's a hole in it, and then there are these parenthesis-like aggregations of protein that semi-close that. In fact, they are called parenthesomes, which I'm not going to write on the board because you're not I'm not going to hold you responsible for that. But you should know that there is a kind of semi-plugged hole that we have here. Yeah, it's too hard to see, isn't it? Let me change colors. It says dolopore. Let me go to see if white looks a little better. Or maybe yellow. Can you see that? Better? D-O-L-I. Yep. Dolopore. Dolopore septum. So that's the septum itself, and then there's this plug that occurs in it. So there's cytoplasmic continuity, at least some cytoplasmic continuity, between the cells, and minor organelles can move through there. But in this case, with the dolopore septum, the nuclei can't move through. The other group, the parasitic fungi, have completely perforated cell walls. Parasitic, yep. Have perforated cell walls. And in fact, the nuclei are going to migrate. In those cases, the nuclei are going to migrate from one cell to another. perforated cell walls in the parasitic basidiomycota. In the mushrooms, this one's over here, perforated cell walls with the dolopore symptom. So our two groups have different, differently divided cell walls. I found a really nice internet resource this morning that talks more about how these differentiated cell, or these perforated cell walls work within the fungi. Many of the fungi have perforations in their cell walls, and I'll post that to an announcement on Canvas. <coughs> Remember clamp connections from the ascomycota, how the asc is formed by the formation, that little closure at the top, the tip of the hyphae turned over and then we got the division of the nuclei to form the ascus from the second cell in that, the penultimate cell. We've got something very similar in the basidiomycota. Here though, this clamp now is going to occur in every cell. So every time the cell divides, we get a I have to find a place to write this. Let me write it along here. A clamp connection one. So there's a clamp connection. Now that has to occur every time the cell divides because every cell is dikaryotic. So the clamp connections are going to be involved in keeping the organism dikaryotic, allowing the organism to remain dikaryotic. So we've got a cell here with two nuclei in it. Now I'm going to draw this out 
as if this clamp was being formed in time. Now, it, this is an older clamp, right? It's all this cell division has already taken place. But I'm going to show you what happens as the cell divides, as this tip cell divides. And the tip cell would have our two nuclei in it. One of those nuclei would undergo mitosis. That's supposed to be the little spindle there. And would migrate. So it migrates through the clamp so that we end up with one of those white nuclei in our next cell. Our second nucleus does essentially the same thing. <laughs> it undergoes mitotic cell division and migrates. Just not as far. And so we end up with now a cell wall drawn between between the cells, and both cells are dikaryotic. So by that migration of the nuclei through the clamp, we get dikaryotic cells. The next slide is going to show that in more a little more detail. But drawn out one stage at a time. Now, I'm not going to require you ever to draw these things out or go through this kind of detail. What I want you to know is what the basic idea of what the clamp connection does. The clamp connection allows these hyphae to remain dikaryotic. And it's needed because there has to be some way for these two nuclei to be handled so that every cell is not doesn't become multinuclear. It could be, you know, if these things are just dividing in this kind of random where the nuclei you end up with one nuclei with one one cell with one nucleus, another cell with three nuclei, next cell division, and maybe more nuclei, maybe there's cells with no, it just gets to be a mess. The organism couldn't function very well. So this is a way of keeping it dikaryotic. So we start out with our clamp, and here's the migration of the nucleus. Here's the mitotic nuclear division. Which gives us our nucleus in the clamp. And we are going to get then some cell walls forming essentially like that. They've drawn them slightly differently, but the idea, again, is that we are going to get two cells, both of which are dikaryotic. So we end up with our two dikaryotic cells. And that happens again. The tip, the tip of the hyphae will grow. Same process takes place again with a new clamp forming from the side. So that's pretty cool. Here are our types of basidia. We've got three types of basidia shown, three basic types of basidia shown. And in fact, some people divide the basidiomycota into classes based on the type of basidia. I'll ask you in a minute how you would name these classes, once we know what the names of these basidia are, how would you name the classes if you were going to make classes based on the types of basidia? So our kind of main basidium, the one that we see a lot in the mushrooms especially, is the one we've looked at already in the electron micrograph, et cetera, and this is the holo basidium. And it's got that little pedestal. and the haploid basidiospores. A variation on that is this tuning fork basidium.
it has exactly the same structure. It's just that the little pedestal has now got elongated prongs on it. There's names for those prongs, by the way. Of course there are names, special terms. We're not going to learn it. The second type is called a phragmobasidium. Phragm, you remember, means fence. So a phragmobasidium has got some internal cell divisions in it, some internal cell walls. And that's what we see here. You can see that here's the basidium. This whole thing is the basidium. There's the basidiospore. And there are divisions so that each basidiospore is, is essentially coming from a separate cell. Now, only one basidiospore is shown fully formed there, but each of those little tips is going to form a basidium, basidiospore. So the phragmal basidium divided up. The final type of basidium is called a teleobasidium. Helio means web or weaving. So the idea here is that we've got a mini mycelium. A mini, because my, mycelium can mean the body of the fungus, but it also has that idea of web or weaving in it again. So we've got this little hyphen here coming out of the basidium. So there is a small, little tiny mycelium, a little tiny hyphen here. Let's spell hyphae with an H this time. Hypha, singular. And that grows out of this spore. This is actually a thick-walled, two-celled resting spore. So if you had a spore that was going to give rise to a teleobasidium, what would you call that spore? A teleospore. That's a teleospore. You're going to be a good way now to starting to understand that these are the parasitic ones that are going to do this. And the teleospores play a really important role in the reproduction of those parasitic mycota. <coughs> so we've got a thick walled spore, then out of that grows a little tiny hyphae, and on those hyphae are the basidia, basidia spores. Okay, so those are types of basidia, holobasidia, phragmobasidium, teleobasidium. What is the class name if you wanted to name a whole class of basidium mycota based on the, this, this kind of holobasidium? I've got to learn more names so I can call them. Kennedy. <laughs> You see? I know you. <laughs> Feel free to ask the people next to you, or just tell me the answer is OK, too. What's the class ending? If we want them in, in the Presidio. Is Kennedy sitting on the left side of the room now? Whoa, you are, you are fast, girl. So we just had a really great lecture yesterday on the biology seminar series, and it told, it told us how what we should be doing is group work in all of these classes so that I should be asking you questions like this every couple of minutes and you should be working on that. I'm, I'm, I'm getting convinced of it now. So we're not sure what the ending is. The class ending is for the fungi. How about a multiple choice? Here's two possibilities. Probably give you mo. 
How many think it's this? Class ending is my coda. How many think it's my CDs? And not Kennedy. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, let's try this again. What, how would you name a class based on the type of basidium if you wanted to make that class name based on whole, the presence of a whole obesidium. <laughs> okay, well, basidiomycetes, but how do, if we did basidiomycetes, how would we know that, that's, that, that that has a whole obesidium in it? Oh, we put the holo on the front, holo basidiomycetes. So that could be a class name for this. I bet this second one's going to be easier. Now, if we wanted to do it for the Fragma Basidium and name it on a class there, what, would, what name would we have? Fragma Basidium Mycetes. And if we wanted to do it for the Telio Basidium? Telio Basidium Mycetes. We would just tack that class ending onto that. And in fact, that's how these, class, these names are made. Now, we're not going to, your book does not use that classification and we are not gonna use it in this class, but I wanted you to think about how you would do it. I'm, you are becoming mycologists. So the names are gonna be different than we're doing here, and I'll talk about the characteristics of which those names are based on in a minute. The only one that's gonna be a little confusing is the teleomycetes. This group is gonna be called, not the teleobacidiomycetes, but the teleomycetes. So just don't get yourself confused on that when we come to the teleomycetes. It's very similar. And the name actually is based on the teleobacidium. It's just not, or the, or the teleospore. So here are our classes. We're going to have three classes of basidiomycota. The first one is called the hymenomycetes. The second one is the gasteromycetes. And the third one, as I've just said, is the teleomycetes. So the teleomycetes is the easiest one to understand. It's based on the presence of a teleospore. So it is based then on that kind of basidium and the kind of spore that gives rise to that basidium. Hymenomycetes and gasteromycetes are a little harder to understand, but they have to do with how the spores are born within the organism. In the hymenomycetes, there is a hymen hymenium. And the hymenium, hymenia means a membrane. Now remember those gills of a mushroom. The gills actually are not the membrane, but the membrane is what lines the gills. So there is going to be a line of basidia. Those are supposed to be basidia. And then basidia spores off of those. Those are supposed to be basidia spores. I have to interpret my diagrams for you, I know. So that's the membrane equals the line of basidia. Gasteromycetes, do you know what gastro? Stomach. Stomach, great. Yeah, because there's medical specialties, gastroenterology and other kinds of things like that. Or you say the gastric juices, the stomach juices. So these are organisms that don't have a hymenium, but the basidia are enclosed in a stomach. They're enclosed in a membrane around the outside. These are the puff balls. It's hard to explain what this is, but these are the puff balls.
the Ur stars, which are really cool, but you probably don't know them yet. And bird's nest fungus, some other kinds of things we'll see there. So those are our three classes. Okay, the Hymenomycetes, the group that includes the mushrooms. <laughs> And I'm just going to say and etc. because we're going to go through them in a little more detail. So here's a longitudinal section through a mushroom, similar as you might see in lab next week. And you can see some of the parts to it. There's the stalk here, which is called the stipe. There's the cap, and that's pretty obvious. And then the planar structure excuse me, the planar structures that are underneath it are called the gills. Most people spell gills with a G, so I'll follow suit, the gills. Now, along the gills, lining the gills, you see there's a darker layer. So that dark layer that lines them. That's the hymenal, hymenal layer. And so that is where the basidia are formed, are stored. The basidia are here. Look at that again in a couple other pictures. Now these <clears throat> photographs, all those three photographs were taken by students in the lab. The city of here. Okay. So here we have the gills. <coughs> and you can see again, now in a little more clearly, let's look at it down here. Here's the hymenial layer. And you can see the basidia and the basidia spores, or at least the basidia spores. on those hymenial layer. Now most of that hymenial layer here, below those basidial spores, they are that, that area, those are the basidia. The hymenial layer does not have to be on flat plates. This is the genus Polyporus, and it's not the only one that's like this, but if you look under here, underneath there you see there's lots of little pores. And the hymenial layer lines those pores. The mycelium it would be down here in the wood. It's growing all through this wood and decaying the wood. There, wood is a very, very resistant structure. It doesn't decay easily, except unless you're a fungus. A fungus have the correct enzymes to break down the secondary compounds in the wood that make the wood so strong. Sorry, that red didn't turn out as quite as well as I would have liked there, but you can, I think, just barely see it, the mycelium. So here's a section through one of those pores. So we're looking now parallel to the cap of that shell fungus. And again, we see the hymenial layer. Now we see it even more clearly. And you can see the basidia spores. And if you're really lucky, sometimes you can actually see that there are exactly four basidia spores on a basidium. I don't see that really clearly in any of these cases. But sometimes you can actually see the four of them on those little, sitting on those little prongs. There's chitin there, right? There's what? Chitin. Uh, the cell walls of, the, of all the fungi have chitin in them. The, it's the cell wall of the hyphae. So the hyphae are, these are all hyphae you're seeing hyphae all through here, and the tips of the hyphae form the basidia, 
and all the cell walls of all of that have chitin in it. Yeah, you know, we didn't remember to talk about that when we talked about the characteristics, but that's true of ascomycota and basidiomycota. They, can, they don't contain cellulose in their cell walls, but they can turn, contain chitin, the same structure that's in the insects. And again, you see a, there's another similarity. Remember the fungi go over there next to the animals. <clears throat> the animal kingdom also has organisms which have chitin. The, the plant kingdom does not, so it suggests that the fungi are over there, should be over there, that the phylogeny is correct. The molecular phylogeny is correct. Well, in addition to the mushrooms, we have the uh, shelf fungi. Polyporus was one example of that, but there's many other shelf fungi. Again, these are almost all wood rot fungi. Some of the mushrooms are, or but not all of the mushrooms are wood decaying fungi. There are the coral fungi. And you can see here that, or I hope you can see with that white, those are the gills where we would find the hymenial layer. So the gills are underneath and they run down the stipe a little bit. So I'm just showing you some of the variations now in the different groups. These are, this is a coral fungus. And at the tips of these, these tips, that's where the hymenial layer would be. I think it actually, the hymenial layer actually runs down on these surfaces too, a bit. So the same basic structure we've seen for the reproduction now, but the structure of the fungus is again. Here's another coral fungus, and it looks a little bit like broccoli, yellow broccoli. <laughs> this is a jelly fungus. The jelly fungi are, uh, you've actually uh, eaten jelly fungi before? Oh, you have, just because you didn't know it. So you have to go, when you went to a, now maybe you've never gone to a really good Chinese restaurant, not the little thing across the street, but I mean, you have to go to a really good <laughs> Chinese restaurant. That one is actually pretty, used to be pretty good across the street. I've eaten there in a while, but they still don't put jelly fungi in their top. But you saw if in those really great Chinese restaurant dishes, you see these little black slimy things. What is that thing there? That's pretty good. Oh, jelly fungus. So they do make it into, yeah, they're all saying, I'm never eating Chinese food again. <laughs> exactly my intent. Here's a mushroom. Here are the basic structure of the mushroom. And now, not all mushrooms have all of the structures we're going to talk about here. But the supermarket mushroom does. And that's the one you're most likely to see. So those little button mushrooms from the supermarket do have these structures. The mushroom is going to start its life, of course, as a mycelium. So here's our mycelium. And at some point, if there's rain in the right conditions, it will that mycelium will group together and it'll form then this cluster. This is the young fruiting body. And that young fruiting body is covered by the universal veil. This covering, the outer covering of that. You rarely see the mushrooms in this stage. But you can see the remnants of the universal veil in the mushroom because they are at the base here, this cup or the Tradition, the uh, scientific term, the Latin term is vulva. It means cup. And at the top, these scales. On the mushroom, those are also remnants of the universal veil. And the scales are just called scales. <clears throat> now the scales, there's nothing wrong with eating those scales on there. But I, rem I remember from my youth that very clearly I remember my grandmother, when we would have mushrooms, used to sit and 
peel the mushroom. Have you ever seen anyone peel a mushroom? You used to peel the surface off the mushroom to get that remnants of the universal veil and that little bit of outer covering off the mushrooms. Things I've never peeled a mushroom in my life. But I have fond memories of watching my grandmother do it. As the mushroom begins to open, the cap bursts out of the universal veil, and there is a second covering. Let me grab a highlighter and see if this will work. That isn't working. I'm trying to draw across this area. There's just no color that's probably going to work there. White. I just tried white. Right, dark color. There you go. Now it's completely obscured, but that <laughs> that's all right. Um, there's a veil that occurs across there. And that veil is called the vellum. And as the mushroom cap opens, we get this remnant of the vellum, and that is the annulus, or the ring. Annulus means ring. Annual means ring. I think we've talked about that before. It's underneath the remnant of the vellum, underneath the annulus, that we find the gills. The technical name for the gills is lamellae, and you looked up, I believe, on your own, the roots for lam lamella, from like lamellin, it means flat plate. And so lamella are the flat plate. Now we're gonna probably use, um, we, let's just say we are gonna use the common English terms here for these, all of these parts. So you don't need to learn all the technical names here. <clears throat> but you, should, you, know, you need to know cap and stipe, the stalk for it. But even if you called it stalk, that would be okay. Here's the supermarket mushroom. There's the cap, the stalk or the stipe. There's the annulus or the ring. And underneath the cap, we would find the gills with the hymenial layer, and the basidia. And here we are back to our Shakti mushroom. Similar kinds of structures here. There is no universal veil in this case but we can see the remnants here of the vellum and cap and stalk. <clears throat> the same basic parts. And then the gills would be inside. They're just, this is mushroom is just opening and so we're seeing the gills under here. It's really so dark on that screen. <laughs> The life cycle, let's do our life cycle in a little more detail now. We've got some of, we understand some of the structures so that we can put the life cycle in context. We remember we have three parts to the life cycle, beginning with plasmogamy over here. <coughs> Fusion of the cytoplasms, and that gives us our dikaryotic stage of a life cycle. This is where the clamp connections are formed. On the gills themselves, we have our basidia, <clears throat> and in those basidia, we're going to get karyogamy.
and also meiosis is going to occur. So we're going to have the di, the diploid. stage of the life cycle, consisting of a single cell, a diploid, a diploid um, basidium. After meiosis, the spores are shed, and so this is the haploid portion of the life cycle, and that consists of our haploid spores and our primary mycelium. Good question. Um, so is the diploid portion the entire bottom half, or is it just that little pie slice there? Just that little pie slice. That's This is diploid here. It's actually really, just like in the ascomycota, it's restricted to a single cell. <laughs> and the only thing in the diploid stage is the basidium. In the diploid stage, is just a basidium. Be clear on the next diagram. Let's do this one, and this will show some of the intermediate stages. This is the textbook, your <clears throat> diagram from the textbook. And our first task is to find our stages. So here's plasmogamy. There's karyogamy, clearly labeled. And meiosis is spread out here through the different stages. So we'll just pick some place in there and say, Meiosis there, karyogamy there, plasmogamy like that. This gives us our, since we were just talking about diploid, do that first. Here's our diploid stage. Let's write karyogamy there. Let's write meiosis here. This is our haploid stage. And plasmogamy. Gives us our dikaryotic. The dikaryotic stage. So everything from plasmogamy, everything here on, these are all n plus n. The cells are n plus n. So the whole basidia carp is n plus n. Remember the ascocarp, it was mixed. Here it's not mixed, it's all n plus n. And you can look here too, this is, you know, that diagram that I showed you of the ascocarp is really famous, and so there you have someone trying to copy it in a really, and did a really crummy job of that. But it's a great idea, you know, that here they're trying to show the stages of the city of formation here. And you can look along that really crudely drawn hymenial layer here at the bottom of those different stages. I'm not gonna go through them, but you should look for them there if you would like to. We get the one circled here and enlarged is the dikaryotic ascus. Now, dikaryotic basidium. So it's just one of those tip cells, the tip of a hyphae now, and it's just started to swell a little bit. The tip of the hyphae is always formed by that clamp connection, so there's nothing special here. It's just no special cell division. It's just the tip of a hyphae, which is dikaryotic. It begins to swell. And in that, we get karyogamy taking place so that we get our diploid ascus. So there's our diploid ascus. And lucky that my observer has left. You're always here, which we're appreciative of. Diploid basidium. So that's the only diploid cell in the life cycle. Meiosis, of course, there's two meiotic cell divisions. We 
if we extend it out here, we've just condensed it to our single line. And at the end of that, we get our haploid spores. So that's our life cycle of the hymeno, hymenium, hymenomycetes. The gasteromycetes have the same life cycle. So we would just change the structure of the basidio carp that we drew there, but all the life cycles features would be the same. The difference is that we have the stomach fungi. And so in this case, the basidium are enclosed, the basidia are enclosed in a structure right up to the time the basidia spores are released. So the, the technical differences between those are, it's very hard to say these things in words. But if you look <clears throat> at the structure of a basidia carp in the hymenomycetes, hymenomycetes you would see that those mushrooms began to open a little bit, right? And the hymenium was exposed. But the spores still weren't being shed yet. So there's a time when the hymenium is exposed, when the basidia are exposed, but there's no spores shed yet. And that's typical of hymenomycetes. That is not the case in the gasteromycetes. In the stomach fungi, it's enclosed. The thing's completely enclosed until the spore release occurs. And that'll get a little clearer here as we go and look at the structure of the puffballs and the earth stars. So here's a puffball. It's the genus Lycoperdron, and we'll see these in lab. Perdon. I'm sorry? They're both the same. <clears throat> um, it's the common name, just like you would call the genus Quercus, the oaks, the common name and the scientific name. So it's not the scientific name, it's the common name. And who knows, there may be some, oh, I'm sure there's places in the world where they call them completely things differently in terms of the common name. So you can see that there is a covering around the outside of the puffball. And if you've seen these things growing in your lawn, sometimes the one in the lawns grow quite large and are single. They don't, they're not shedding spores. And in fact, if you take them and you can, you can cut them open and as far as I know, there are no poisonous puffballs. My other grandmother used to eat puffballs all the time. She was always excited when we got puffballs in our lawn, and she would fly them up in lots of butter. And, and this, may, this brings me to one of my fa father's famous sayings, which is that anything tastes good if you put enough butter on it. I think Julie Childs had that same philosophy. Um, so you can fry these up in butter, but my point was that the center of the puffball, when you're eating them like that, is solid. It, the spores haven't been released. Only when they completely dry out, that outer covering becomes very thin and membrane-like, and the whole center of the puffball essentially turns into spores. And at that stage, when you break it open, just this huge mass, and the spores in my front yard were always green, spores would come out of it. You don't want to eat them at that stage. So here's what that is. Here's our outer covering. And we find on the inside our basidia and basidia spores. And you just can't see the difference in there. But that whole center portion of it, the basidia are going to be so small, and most of it is just spores, going to be just spores, so that when the thing dries out, 
that outer covering then will break open and the spores will be released. So you see why stomach fungi is appropriate here. And you see what I'm trying to say about the spores being retained inside this structure until right until they're released. Here are the earth stars. These are really cool fungi. Please find me some earth stars. The earth stars are like the pump walls, except that there are two coverings here. And of course, there are names for these, but we're not going to learn them. We're just going to do the outer. There's an outer covering, and there's an inner covering. And you see that there's a little hole. And when these are open, and the outer, you see here the outer covering is peeling back as it dries out, that inner covering is really um, very, it's like parchment, right? Very thin parchment. So it's flexible. And any wind or raindrops or things will come down and hit that, and it'll puff the spores up. So it's little, like a little volcano puffing spores up. <coughs> so you, if you find these things, you can squeeze them a little bit, and it'll puff, puff them up. The spores will come out of the Earth Star. So they're often found, you see here they're growing on uh, decaying leaf matter, it looks like. Those look a little bit like pine needles or super needles. And they are found, all, when I found them, they're always growing on the um, margins of woods. So a very common place that we've seen them. And they're not huge, they're about, you know, that size, that size. Here's the section through them, and on the, the center again, we would have the basidia spores and the basidia. And now we have an outer and an inner layer. And that inner layer is similar in structure to the layer that covers the puff balls, but now there's an outer layer that's much thicker and harder and is going to pull back and break open when the first star opens. These are the bird nest fun birds nest fungi. I think we'll stop here in just one second. We're looking for these too, if you see these. These are much smaller. So that uh, across there, that's five millimeters maybe, maybe less, maybe three to three to five millimeters. Very small, looks like little bird's nest. This looks like little eggs in the bird's nest. These are called peridioles. Parity means stomach or sac. It's, so they're little stomachs. And <clears throat> you can see them over here also, the peridioles. The basidia are in here. Basidia spores are in there. And a raindrop will come down and it'll splash these pretioles out. And that's and then the pretioles will open to release the spores. So they're dispersed by rain like this. So they're really cool little orbits. They're really beautiful to look at under the microscopes. We have old ones in the lab. We don't have any really new ones. Where did you find them? I found them. Um, on decaying wood, um, but on like, so if you take and you put wood chips down on your garden, I have found them growing in those wood chips. That's the only place I found them. So they're common decay fungus.